Good morning, everybody. Um, let me first just begin asking those who are sitting on the last three chairs, come forward, please. Uh, those chairs are reserved for our passes activities. Uh, come, come forward, come forward. <coughs> I have a lot of space here. <coughs> okay. So as Danny mentioned, today we're going to begin a couple of, uh, of topics uh, about the basics of spiritism. For those who uh, have come for the first time, are coming for the first time, and for those who already know, but it's always good to revisit uh, the main tenets of, of this philosophy. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of spiritism. Uh, feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. Um, and I just wanted to begin with uh, a quotation from Kardec on the Medium's book, when he's talking about, you know, uh, discussing with people about the, the philosophy, the doctrine itself, and the lack of need of trying to convince or convert people to, to become spiritists. And he said, but if you, if you, before, if, if you are ever going to try to explain spiritism to someone, before trying to make somebody a spiritist, we have to make the person first a spiritualist. And he makes this distinction, and I think it's important for us to understand this difference between spiritualism and spiritism. The, th the first thing we have to ask ourselves um, is uh, if, if a person believes that there's anything in us that resides in us that survives the disaggregation of physical body, what we call death, right? If you don't think that there's anything in us that survives the, the, the destruction of physical body, then that, that type of philosophy of thinking is materialism, right? Everything is made of matter. All our properties, all our characteristics are derived from our physical body. When we die, it's done. There's nothing that's vacuum after. But if you think that there is something in us that survives this destruction of the physical body, then <coughs> the next logical question is, do we think that this something retains its individuality after the disaggregation or the separation of the physical body? Because if it, if it doesn't, then it's almost like it didn't survive at all. Because if it returns to a whole uh, uh, individuality, like some philosophical doctrines like pantheism um, uh, advocates, that our spirit is uh, expression of this whole intelligence of the universe, and when it, when it dies, it goes back and merges and loses all the experience. It's like we, it's like, it's, it's as, it's as if we lost our, our individuality in that whole. So we, dis we as an individuality disappear in the end, right? So this would be a form of plantation. But if we believe that this something that exists in us retains its individuality, and keeps living after the disaggregation of the physical body, then we are spiritualists. We uh, believe that there's something el else in us, that, um, which is the core of what we are, that is immortal. What happens to this thing? That's where the different philosophical doctrines differ. For us, for spiritism, we believe that this something is called a soul, was created by God or a spirit. This spirit keeps reincarnating in different physical bodies in order to improve itself as many times as needed to progress to relative perfection, either here on Earth or in other planets, and that the physical beings that are incarnated can communicate with the physical beings who are not incarnated. Um, <coughs> so that, that philosophical doctrine is what spiritism is. There are other philosophical doctrines who believe that when this something dies, the soul goes to either eternal hell or eternal heaven, right? Others believe that the soul uh, stays sleeping until the day of the final judgment. Other philosophical doctrines believe that you know, it goes to either heaven, hell, can be destroyed or awaits for the arrival of the Messiah. Some other doctrines believe that this thing they call Atma transmigrates transmigrates between difficult physical bodies, including those of animals, uh, until in a cycle of life and death, until they achieve liberation. So, and many others. So what differentiates all these spiritualist doctrines is their, their understanding of what happens to that something. And we're going to talk about, we're going to focus on spiritualism. Right? So is it clear the difference? 
Spiritism is a subset of uh, is a spiritualist philosophical body of knowledge or doctrine that has a set set of of uh, principles, like any other of those also has a set of principles, and those are the ones we're going to talk about: the existence of God, reincarnation, communication, mediumship. All of those we're going to be talking about in this series of of talks. Spirituality in C is not a creation or an idea or an invention of spiritism. It is. Uh, it is with man since since it became conscious of the environment around it. Throughout time, mankind has tried to reach divinity or to reach this <coughs> other realm or what it believes was the origin of its of its you know its creation. Um, and we have this recorded on on human history through throughout the world in different civilizations in different times. Um, and uh, in different peoples, be, cultural beliefs. So it's it's pretty much widespread. This inner feeling, this innate <coughs> feeling that there's something in us, or there's someone greater than us that, that governs and then structures the universe. <coughs> so this is the very early time of civilization. There have been many people who came, like Moses, to, to begin structuring this, this idea of, of a deity uh, on, on a personification of one single unique God, then Christ came to, to give us an idea of, a better idea of the characteristic of this divinity. Um, but throughout time, other um, people acted and came as precautions of the idea that once would be, one time would be what we have called spiritual today. One of those people was Swedenborg. Um, in 1744, he had these experiences in which he um, was transported to uh, a different state of conscious, and he would see beings uh, of creation on, on different forms. Uh, he began to write down and to categorize his experiences, and he kind of form a, a, a philosophical doctrine also, per se, let's say, per se. But if you look at this, although they're not exactly the same, but they are foundations of principles, of the beginning of the spreading of the understanding of the laws that today we understand uh, um, as, as the fundamental laws of spiritism. For instance, he would say, uh, the world which, which we all go after consists of a number of different spheres representing various shades of luminosity and happiness each of us going to that for which our spiritual condition has fitted us, kind of alluding to our future happiness or, or happiness depends on how we here on Earth behaved. Um, he also said we are judging in automatic fashion by some spiritual law uh, and the result being determined by the total of the actions of our life. Um, he mentioned also this uh, celestial beings who he, he uh, acknowledged as being either demons or angels, but they were not of a different nature. They were a spirit of men who once lived in earth and were either good men, being what he called the angels, or bad men, what he called the demons. So he, those, those concepts were kind of pre -con initial ideas of concepts that will come more clearly later with, with Kardec. In the U that was in Europe. In the U.S., there are many examples. I'm just picking some uh, events that happens in a in a community of uh, of uh, the Shakers, which were um, a part of the Quakers community who had specific type of worshiping and and religious doctrine and belief. Um, at some point around the 1800s, 1837 to 44, there was a lot of uh, manifestations occurring in this community where the spirit of Red Indians would come and communicate through several of those uh, individuals in that community. Um, later on, uh, I don't want to get it a very long discussion on this, but later on, uh, a historian studying uh, this occurrence, he divided these manifestations in three periods. The first phase, which is more like the actual happenings, the, the the manifestations per se, the physical part, to call attention that the, act act the, the, the action was actually real, right? The second phase in one was a phase of instruction where knowledge was transmitted to, to this community. 
And the third phase that was called the missionary phase was putting that knowledge into practice. And if you look at this, this is exactly what is happening with spiritism. We had the table turnings, the physical phenomena that call attention to the phenomena. We're going to get, get to that. Then we have the, the phase of instruction, the codification, the setting up of the principles. And now uh, the phase of putting love into practice, which, which is charity, which is so important today in the spiritual movement. Uh, so going back to the Shakers, uh, those um, manifestations occur for seven years. And when they stopped, the last communications of the spirits were saying that they were going out, but they would come back, the spirits would come back uh, shortly. And, they, and this was a localized in this specific community in the US, but they would come back pervading the world and entering the, uh, the palace as well as the cottage, meaning everywhere there would be a spiritual manifestation. And, and soon enough, just four years later, the knockings at processions uh, broke out. So this is considered by many uh, as the starting point of modern spiritualism the series of events will happen with the Fox family in uh, Rochester, New York, in Heightsville. The Fox family was a family of Canadian farmers who moved to the U US, and they bought some property close to New York. They were constructing a house, and while they were, the house wasn't ready, they rented um, a, a cottage, a, you know, a little house around, um, to stay while their house was being built. This house, uh, <coughs> they moved on December 11, 1847, but it has history of previous tenants, re tenants reporting strange sounds, raps, noises, uh, in without a specific origin inside the house. Before the Fox family, the Bell family had lived there, and uh, you know it was a couple, and they, they had a servant, a, a person, a helper, um, and at some day they were visited by a peddler. Um, that, you know, while well, they are selling stuff, right? They he had pots, pans, and things that are useful to houses. Um, he stayed at his house for a couple of days, a week, perhaps, and then wasn't heard of that mo no more, right? Uh, the family moved, another family lived there, and then the Fox family uh, moved to this place. Um, as soon as they began there, they began hearing the noises again, and at at the time passed, the frequency and intensity of the noises began increasing to the point that the family couldn't sleep at all at night. Um, rappings, sounds of footsteps going down from the second floor down to the cellar of the house, to the basement of the house. Um, and uh, they couldn't find. The Mr. Fox was trying to, trying to determine the origin of the noise, and he was like knocking everywhere in the house. And his, one of the daughters, um, Katie Fox, um, noticed that while he was stepping around the house, the noises would repeat the number of knocks he would do. So in a kind of a, uh, they were always, of course, terrified that they were fearful for, for the phenomena. But she was like being a kid, 11 years old. She began like daring, playing with, with the origin of the noise. And she and her, her other sister had a nickname for whatever is causing the, the, the phenomena. They call him Mr. Splitfoot. Uh, and she said, do as I do. And she began clapping her hands a, number, a set number of times, and the knockings would repeat. So soon the, the adults realized that the rappings and the noises were obeying or re replying to her requests. Then they began to ask a set of questions, and they defined it like one for yes, two for no. And they began, um, began this interchange, what, what um, Arthur Conan Doyle in this History of Spiritism, which is a very interesting book, he has a very interesting text that he says, however humble the operator at either end, the spiritual telegraph was at last working, and it was left to the patience and moral earnestness of the human race to, to determine how high might be the uses to which was put in the future. So that, that night, uh, March 31st, 1848, because of this initial intentional communication with the spiritual world, this is considered as to be the, the initiation of the modern spiritist movement in here in the US. 
Um, so <coughs> soon the families around were called to try to understand the, the neighbors, right? Uh, the, the phenomenon on, would, would only occur when either Katie or her sister or Margaret were present. Um, they uh, began um, being understood that the phenomenon depended on her. They were uh, uh, called mediums and they um, began after this fact uh, doing public appearances and disseminating this uh, spiritualist movement. For the arrest of the, um, uh, the incident, Mr. Splitfoot was later recognized to be the spirit of a once 31-year-old Charles Rosma, the peddler who had lived with the Bell family and was murdered in that house. He, through this wrapping, told that his body was to be found in the, in the basement of the house. They um, excavated, uh, they, you know, they, uh, they, they only could find um, some a piece of hair, a piece of the skull, which looked like to be a piece of human bone, um, and, and nothing more. Because everybody assumed he was going to be buried in the ground. It was only 56 years later, when the family folks was not even living there anymore, that uh, one, of, one of the walls in the, in the basement collapsed, and they found the full skeleton with a, the piece missing in the skull. It was buried actually in the walls of the, of the basement. Um, and they also found the, bed, the box where he, he, you know, he would keep his goods and uh, many other uh, things from, from, the, you know, from the, his, his trading. Uh, it, all those things are today uh, in a museum in Rosh Hashan, New York, um, and, and can be visited. Although the house burned down and it's not the actual house, it's a, it's a reproduction. Um, but then in the U.S., with all this... Uh, public appearances, the spiritualist movement become, became very notorious uh, with, you know, Kitchens and Margaret Foss and, and other people who began to experience mediumship. There was uh, a lot of publicity on top of it, a lot of public interest. Periodicals were being created to report on spiritualist news. And on April 1853, a ship <coughs> <coughs> containing many of these periodicals with some mediums uh, going to, um, to Europe, uh, docked, I think, in, in England, um, and took uh, some of this already kind of structured spiritualist movement from the U.S. to Europe. Of course, at that time, there was already the same thing happening there. And th that in Europe, they were calling this phenomena the turning table phenomena. Um, it became very quickly fashionable in parties and dinner at, you know, in, at night to entertain people with this phenomena where um, they would gather around in, you know, in a social event and some people, uh, specific people, would have the capacity of making these tables, you know, turning, uh, moving, and these people were called mediums. They were invited to entertain the guests, to amuse the audience, which was not regarded as a, as, a, as a serious phenomenon at all, right? And the interesting thing is that table would turn and they would, they would levitate and, and tap with one of their feet a certain number of times, in the same way that in Fox, the Fox house, they would uh, say yes or no, or if you assign an, each letter to a certain number of types, they be, uh, or taps, they would begin spelling messages. That was actually which called attention because if, because if it was only the, me the physical phenomenon, it may have been disregarded altogether. But the fact that the tables would answer questions and sometimes questions that none present in, the, in that union knew the answer uh, began calling attention of some serious people, many serious people. One of those, an educator who, um, who uh, was in France, called uh, Hippolyte Léon Denizard Rival. Uh, he was um, educated in uh, Yverdon uh, with Pestalozzi, uh, a, a guy who was renowned for groundbreaking educational uh, methods at the time. Um, he was already a professor at that time. He was professor in mathematics and French. He 
He was fluent in several languages. Uh, he was uh, in 23, he became interested in the theories of magnetism and he, he joined the Parisian Society for Magnetism, um, which is, um, which was, you know, discovered and, and compiled by Franz Mesmer. At that point, <coughs> from his early uh, days until the age of 50, he built his reputation. He was a professor, he had school, schools in France. But he was, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, very skeptical about this phenomenon. Uh, it was only at the age of 50 when his attention was um, brought to, the, to this phenomenon of the turning tables. Um, he says in the post his posthumous works <coughs> sorry, that in 1854, one of his friends, a magnetizer, Mr. Fortier, asked, asked him if he had heard about the <coughs> new discoveries in magnetism. Apparently, it was possible not only to magnetize people, but also tables. And the tables would re respond, they would reply. To which he said, that I only believe when they prove to me that a table has a brain to think, nerves with which to feel, and it can go <coughs> in a symbolic stage. It took him uh, more than one year to begin attending those meetings, but he went with, a, with an intent of understanding what was going on. He was invited to a meeting on the, on the, the home of Miss <coughs> Plain Maison. When he first witnessed the phenomena in conditions that, you know, he, he couldn't, he didn't find any, any uh, evidence that there was uh, uh, fake or, or um, mystification. Then he, be he decided to begin working. He, he says, I glimpse in those apparent frivolities in the advocation that was made of the phenomena, somewhat of a serious nature, some revelation of a new law, which I took upon myself to study seriously. So that, um, thank you. Thanks so much. So that disposition to, to seriously look and study the phenomena past the, the diversion, the entertainment that it was being taken for at the time was what uh, was really different with Kardec. Um, in, in the Mrs. Plain Maison house, he, m he bought the Baudin family and he began attending the, the meetings the, of the Baudin family where the mediums were uh, the two kids of the Baudin family. In the beginning, I was seeking myself. Later, realizing that all comprised the whole in the proportions of a doctrine, it occurred to me to publish the teachings for the benefit of others. So that's when he began collecting a lot of material, not only from the meetings where he was uh, going himself, but also material he received from other people. And how spirituality works is sometimes funny, not funny, but interesting, because a group of friends who have been going to these meetings for five years now had a lot of material, five notebooks full of information, but they couldn't sort it out. It was a lot of it. But they knew Kardec was an a, a, a educator. He was very uh, organized and had a rare aptitude for synthesis. So they gave the notebooks to him, 50 notebooks full of information <coughs> and ask him to compile. It was a very tedious work and he was not very keen on doing it in the, in the beginning. But in one of the meetings, his, his own protector spirit, Zephyr, came to him, told him that he and Kardec, uh, Ivail, were longtime friends from the time when they lived in Gaul at the time of the Druids. And then in that incarnation, Ivail's name was Alain Kardec. And he said he was going to help revile with this very important task of organizing that material. <coughs> so he goes there, he patiently compiles all the notes, removes duplicates, order them chronologically, mark all the missing pieces, uh, you know, get all the confusing parts and the clarification, prepare questions to answer to those clarifications that were needed. And he began treating this as a new science. So he used the new experimental method that has been 
recently been applied to natural sciences like physics and chemistry. The one that he never had preconceived ideas, he would look at the facts, observe them, compare, and deduce consequences. And from the facts, the, he, would, he would get to um, the laws by logical deduction, uh, and logical concatenation of the facts. He received, especially after the publication of the first books, a lot of material. It is said that at the end, uh, at the five books of the Spiritual Codification, he received information from more than 37 countries in more than 268 cities. Um, people sending him communications, mediumistic uh, uh, works that have been happening all around. And he became the center of this correspondence uh, and had access to all this material. Not all of this material was published, not all of the uh, And so he had to sort out which was, let's say, true and which was not. And what he employed that, and what the spirits told him to employ was the universal control principles. If one thing is coming up in different places for different people for in, in different times, <coughs> that is a message that's actually being transmitted by the superior spirits. Rather than a specific uh, uh, theory that's raised by one person only and, and does not withstand this, this um, uh, universal control, let's say, check checkpoint. So, <coughs> This information was coming from everywhere, from different types of mediums, did not depend on one single person, did not depend on one single nat nationality, did not stem from any known specific religion, do not belong to any particular social class, and it was transmitted gradually by the enlightened spirits. So, compiling all these notes and questions and materials, he decided to, first, to, to write the first book, the spirits book. And take, take a look here, there's an apostrophe here. Is the book, is the property of the spirits? Is the, spirit, the book of the spirits, right? It's not his book. That was the first acknowledgement that it was not he who was the owner of this knowledge. We, all his information was coming from the spiritual plane, by the spirits, through the mediums. If he was going to publish then a book in such condition, then his next question was, what is the name that I'm gonna use? He was already a very renowned educator in, in Paris. He's no, he had published several books, grammars, uh, books on arithmetics, books on history. <coughs> he was known. He, was, he, wouldn't, he didn't think he was, should publish as revile, and the spirits agree with him. He said, this is not your work. This is a work that you have been tasked to organize, so uh, you should publish with a different name. And they, they recommended him to use the name of, he, of his previous incarnation. That's when Revile became Allan Kardec. He published the first book under this pseudonym. Uh, and in 18 of April, 1857, the first edition came out um, on the bookstore of uh, Mr. Dentou on the Palais Royal in Paris. And initially, this book was organized in three parts. It contained 501 questions, and it talked about the Spiritist Doctrine itself, 10 chapters, the moral laws, and uh, uh, the last part was about hopes and consolations. The Spirits book had several editions, and the, the ones we have today is the fourth edition, the one that contains the current text. Um, it is the backbone of the Spiritist Doctrine. It contains the moral um, and the, the philosophical uh, aspects of the doctrine, and is divided <coughs> today in four parts. Uh, let me just go to the next one. So, the first part is about the primary causes. It talks about God, the general elements of the universe, creation, the vital principle. The second part is about the spirit world. It talks about the communication and the nature of the spirit world. The third part is about the moral laws, and the fourth part, fourth part is about the hopes and consolation. Each one of these parts was later developed and expanded in another book. Uh, so this, the Spirits books was published first in 57, and in 61 came the Medium's book, which was a development of the second part of the Spirits book uh, about uh, the, the, it was a manual of evocation and communication with, with spirituality. Then the Gospel According to Spirit was published next year, uh, in 64, as a development of the moral part of the Spirits book. The Heaven and Hell was published as an expansion of hopes and consolations, and finally the Genesis 
was published um, in 1868. Those are the five main works, basic, we call the basic, wo basic works of the spiritual doctrine or codification. And they have the core uh, knowledge, but um, it goes beyond those five books because right after the publication of the first book, the Spirit's book, he began, as I said, receiving letters, questions, communications, reports from everywhere. And he didn't have a place, he didn't have the capacity to respond to all of that. So he created a periodical, which uh, was a Spirits Review, a Spirits magazine, <coughs> the following year, in which he used to communicate with all these people. He would get questions, and he used the Spirits Review to respond one question to many. Right? He would put the question there and put his view. Um, it was an open forum. Right? He could respond to the questions of some to the benefit of many. And many of the chapters of the future books were first published as articles in the Spirits Review. And for the next 12 years, until the time of his death, he published one issue every month for every year uh, until he, he died. In, um, and, and, and together, those 12 editions of, uh, uh, of the Spirits Review, 12 years of the Spirits Review, plus the five years of five books of the Spirits Codification are the main, the main uh, the basis, the main works of, of the Spiritist Doctrine. Uh, we have already four of those translated into English. Um, they, are, they were translated and printed by the United States Spirits Federation. We have uh, 1861 and 60 here, um, two of those four, but we can, you can order them online in the Spirits Federation website. <coughs> and it's very rich material uh, to whoever is interested in deepening the understanding and the study on spiritism. So, just talking quickly about the Spirit's book, uh, each one of the books. The Medium's book was published in 61. It is uh, the book in which Kardec uh, clarifies questions about uh, the evocation and the communications. Uh, it's the safest guide for those who want to explore, safely explore mediumship is contained in this book. The Gospel According to Spiritism is the part that contains the moral teachings of the Spiritist Doctrine. Um, it talks about the moral teachings of Christ. Not all the Gospel explained, but the mainly the passages that talk about his moral teachings. Um, and the superior spirits explain the parables and show um, the, the grandiosity of the teachings of, of this, this uh, high evolved spirit, which we today didn't understand completely, haven't understood completely. Heaven and Hell uh, uh, is a, an account uh, of um, different types of spirits in different situations that come back and tell us how their life is in the spiritual world <coughs> and what were the situations uh, in their life that led to their situation, their current situation, and what do they envision to be their future. Um, Genesis um, talks about is divided in three parts. The first part talks about the, the spirit's revelation, in, per se, the biblical Genesis, formation of universe. The second part talks about the miracles and how the miracles are actually natural phenomena, explained by laws that so far hadn't been understood. And the third part talks about predictions and foreknowledge and discusses several in instances of those, uh, those, those episodes contained in the Gospels. Uh, Kardec also published, in order to facilitate and disseminate the understanding of the spiritual doctrines, uh, a small book, a booklet actually, called Spiritism in its Simplex Expression. Um, that book was published the year before the Spirits book in 62, and it was intended to give people a quick background and historical perspective. Uh, it has three parts, history of spiritism, a summary of the teachings, and uh, some maxims of the spiritual doctrine. What is interesting is that it was published in 62, and on the same year, we already had a copy of that translated into Portuguese by the commission of the, uh, the kings of Brazil and, and Portugal. Um, and as we were discussing this morning about how, how quickly spiritism spread to Brazil, and um, at, the, at the same day, uh, same year, we had already um, this publication and others uh, being circulating in our language in, in Portuguese and, and, uh, and you know, 
being taken uh, for, for um, discussion in that country. Kadek uh, worked until his last day, literally. He died handing out an issue of the speeches review to somebody who went to buy an edition there. Uh, so he lived his whole, his whole uh, work the same way he died uh, uh, working. And his uh, resting place is today in Paris, uh, in, a <coughs> in a cemetery in Paris. Um, and is one of the most visited uh, tombs or dolmens, in the form of a dolmen, uh, in, in um, homage to his past incarnation as a, as a Druid. Um, but it's, um, it is uh, like the, from that point on, the Spiritist Society of Paris, uh, Society for Spiritist Speech, Speech Studies that he created went on um, disseminating knowledge, uh, the publication of all his, his books were translated in several languages. We had many, in many countries, uh, societies created to study this doctrine, like in Brazil, this, the Spirits, Brazilian Spirits Federation, and here in the US, the US Spirits Federation or Council, uh, that are dedicated to the understanding, the studying, and the dissemination of these spiritual principles. Um, so that's what I wanted to bring to you about a uh, brief history of spiritism. Those are the books I use. Uh, I highly recommend this book, uh, History of Spiritualism. It's available both in English and in Portuguese. Um, this is a biography of Kardec. Uh, that's, I think this one is not translated to English yet and the basic works of the speeches codification to anyone who wants to understand a little bit more about, uh, a lot more actually, about uh, what spiritu spiritism really is. And we still have five minutes, so if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to, to ask.